Good morning, church. Welcome to Crossview. There's a lot of confusion right now as to meeting, not meet, go and get your nails done, don't go and get your nails done, get a haircut, don't get a haircut. There's just a lot of confusion, but you know what? In Christ Jesus, there is no confusion. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is our God. He went to the cross to save us from an eternity of sin. There is no doubt about that. There is no confusion there. And we know from the moment that we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior that we are forever cleansed from our sin. And that at that point in time, we have eternal life. God is good. And again, there is no confusion in him. So we are going to worship a mighty God today. We're going to do a quick reading from Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Praise God and thank Him for His goodness and His mercy.
John 1, 1 reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Hebrews 2, 9 through 11. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with the glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family, so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. stood before creation eternity in your hand you spoke the earth into motion my soul now to stand you stood Offer 
Chapter 7, verses 1 through 10 says this. When Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well.
Father, Lord Jesus, we come before you with praise and thanksgiving, Lord. You are our healer. You are all we need. You are all sufficient. 
You are God of all sufficient grace and mercy and love. And it is through you that we are truly healed. We are healed of our sin. We are healed of our despair. We are healed of our enslavement. Your Holy Spirit moves mightily, Lord God, and we thank you, Lord Jesus, for going to the cross so that we could be forever freed of the burden of sin and death. Thank you for being our great high priest. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for being our Lord. Thank you for being our healer. Well, good morning. I think we can all say it's been good to be with the Lord today. We may not all be in his house at Crossview Church physically, but we can be in his house spiritually wherever we are because the Holy Spirit is not limited to time and space. And so I'm glad that we can say to each other this morning in spirit and before long, hopefully in person, good morning. We welcome you today. And all who are watching online as we celebrate yet another Lord's Day together. We trust that you'll be blessed today as we look into the Word of God and consider His message for us. Now, speaking of blessings, there are basically two types of blessings, spiritual and physical. Physical blessings, of course, include food and shelter and clothing and health. Even emotional and psychological relationships can be classified as though we experience with other human beings or, as, or, or the connection that we have with the Lord. We have certainly been reminded these last six weeks how important physical health is and the links that we will go to have it and keep it. In fact, we've submitted to a way of life that would have been considered ridiculous and unacceptable just two months ago. But if we're not careful, even as Christians who know Jesus and want to follow him, we can place more importance on the physical than the spiritual. A barometer of what is important to us is how much time we spend thinking, talking, planning, and doing about physical needs versus our spiritual connection with the Lord and with others. Now, sometimes it's tempting for Christians to have a lot more focus on the negative ramifications of COVID-19 rather than how God is blessing us in spite of it. As physical beings, we're always going to be concerned and committed to do our best to ensure that our physical life is safe and fulfilling. But in studying and praying over our scripture passages today, I was reminded and convicted when I realized how much time I've spent planning for and thinking about my physical life versus being aware of and thankful for all the ways God has blessed me and filled me with his love, grace, and mercy during this time. Now, there's been more time for Debbie and I to spend together. There's been more time to spend with our extended family, even though it is on Zoom. There, I've had time, more time to study and pray, and I've been blessed to participate in the worship team as well as preach each week. I've been able to connect with all of you on calling posts and with the sermon notes, and I've been blessed to encourage even my students from school as I interact with them throughout the week by teaching virtual piano lessons. Along with the challenges that come with teaching using the internet, it has created some hilarious moments. In the very first week, I had a little first grader who's extremely smart, and he kept hitting this note with his ring finger that was supposed to be his pinky, so he was hitting the wrong note. And I kept telling him, use your pinky, use your pinky, and he would look at me and then hit his ring finger, look at me and then hit his ring finger. Finally, after I said it three times, he, he used his thumb. And I said, no, not your thumb, your pinky. You know, the finger on the other end of your hand. Well, then he hit his thumb on his left hand instead. And, but, and then one more time, when I said, just try it one more time, he turned the page. I said, the note's not on that page. You had it in front of you. You just, don't, you just can't find your pinky today. So we've had some interesting moments even doing that. But you know, the best blessing is that I've been reminded of some wonderful truths and the fact that God is living life with us each moment of every day. The truth that is both amazing and uplifting is that we can know, no matter what happens in this life, that we have eternal life in Jesus, and our eternal destiny is in heaven. And in this ongoing lifestyle, we have the Holy Spirit with us, active 
and powerful each and every moment. As believers, we know this to be true because the Word of God confirms it. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God and is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Now, for those of us who are saved, we have experienced the confirmation of these verses in our hearts and lives, but sometimes in living life as we know it today, we can rob ourselves of the blessing of experiencing the joy and peace that God intended for us to have through our connection with his Holy Spirit. Now, all of the rhetoric and encouragement any pastor can preach will not bring the spiritual blessing God has for you unless you consistently make eating and breathing spiritually a vital part of your everyday life. We eat spiritually by consuming the words. Jeremiah said in chapter 14, verse 16, when I discovered your words, I devoured them. They are my joy and my heart's delight. We breathe spiritually by praying. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call to me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. So we ingest the word by reading it, then absorbing it into our thought processes, and then joyfully embracing it, and finally by acting in faith upon what we have read. We excel spiritually through prayer and inhale as we wait for God to speak to our hearts through the Holy Spirit. If we were to ask any born-again believer, do you want the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life, probably no one would say, no, I'd rather depend on myself. But for him to become the driving force in our lives, controlling our thoughts and attitudes, as well as our speech, behavior, and plans, we have to willingly and purposefully submit to his guidance in our lives. The only way we can live life experiencing the blessing God has for us is by being aware of the Spirit's presence 24-7 and giving Him total control. So today as we continue to consider God's gift of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and what it means to commit ourselves completely to His guidance and direction, we once again start with the 14th chapter of the book of John beginning with verse 13 and reading through verse 16. I'll just read all these verses, and then we'll make some comments on each one. Starting with verse 13. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. This is Jesus talking. So that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. As Jesus spoke these words, he was speaking in context. We tend to separate verses. But putting them in a nutshell, so to speak, he is saying the key to having the Holy Spirit active in our life is to ask, then believe, love, and obey. And so the first 13 is talking about asking. He says, if you ask for anything in my name, I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Now, there's a little word at the beginning of that that we forget about sometimes, the little word if. This word is included because Jesus knew that even as Christians, we would have a tendency to separate the spiritual from the rest of our lives. We somehow thinks that, think that things we need, such as toilet paper, are not the kind of things we need to bother asking God for. Even in figuring out how we're going to navigate the COVID-19 lifestyle, we all can be guilty of making a plan without praying first and asking the Lord to show us the right path a path that would not only be safe, but would also give us the opportunity to somehow bring glory to him. Because you see, it's not just about whether we get to it physically without getting sick or not. It's in the midst of the potential crisis that could come to our lives, are we bringing glory to God? And even being a witness to those who don't know him as their Savior and Lord. Because if you've got a peace during this time, you're an unusual person. And the only way we have that is through our relationship with the Lord through his Holy Spirit. So to successfully live our lives with the power of God, the activity of whether or not to include God in every part of our lives cannot be left, left to how we are feeling in the moment. You see, if including God is iffy or occasionally or most of the time, we'll find ourselves doing life some of the time without his power and guidance and blessing. James 4.2 says you do not have 
because you do not ask. So when it comes to engaging the Lord about every issue of our life, the if needs to go away. Whenever we have any question, problem, or desire, the first step should be to ask the Lord. Now, once we've made the commitment to ask the Lord for everything that we need, then to follow through and ask him in faith, the kind of faith that can get up from the prayer and have complete confidence that God is going to provide in the way that is best for us, exactly what we need, and even more. We knew a lady in a former ministry who gave witness to the fact that every morning on the way to work, she prayed and asked God to help her find a parking place. God is interested in the details of our life. Once we've asked, we must believe. Jesus goes on to say in verse 14, yes, ask for anything in my name and I will do it. Sometimes we have a hard time believing he will do even things we know are in his will. He didn't say, I might do it. He didn't say, sometimes I'll do it. He didn't say, maybe I'll do it. He didn't say, if I'm not too busy, but he says, I will do it. Once we ask, we must believe that God will answer. Now, a lot of you know, I grew up in the home of a pastor, and he pastored churches in Texas and also in Michigan, and we were encouraged, even as very young children, to tithe. Now, I had a problem with that because we were supposed to tithe on our allowance I don't know if my dad ever thought about this or not, but my allowance was a quarter. And I had a hard time trying to figure out how to give God two and a half cents. But I didn't want to give him three because I didn't want to overgive, and I didn't want to give him two because I didn't want to undergive. But unfortunately, as I grew older and I began to, in high school, teach piano and make an income, and then college, pay for myself through college, and then get a secular job, so I began to make more money and have more bills my passion for tithing that the faith of a little child might have began to wane. And so I lived my life pretty much as a young adult in college and after that without tithing at all. Now I'd go to church every Sunday and I would typically give God whatever was left over in my wallet. And even after Debbie and I got married, I paid the bills and she handled all the household uh, expenses. And so I still Many times our family was not tithing and she didn't really, wasn't really aware of it because she trusted me. But something happened in my life that caused me to, to realize and, and helped me to grow in my faith and also gave me a lesson about trusting God and obeying the Holy Spirit. And I won't go into a lot of detail about this, but I had a job for 11 years that one day was decided that that, that corporation was not going to have a plant or a business or a factory there anymore. That was my main and our main source of income. And I didn't know how we were gonna make it because I got a little bit of severance and a little bit of vacation pay when I left. But you know what? I knew I had robbed God. I knew I had not been worthy of, 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 of calling myself a Christian even though by that time I had prayed to receive Christ. We were married, we had a little boy too and a little girl on the way. And as I left the plant that day for the very last day, I had no idea when that little bit of money they gave me was going to run out what we were going to do because jobs in Detroit then were not any more plentiful than they are today. And as I left that plant that day, God just got a hold of my heart. And I realized I hadn't trusted him. I hadn't trusted the Holy Spirit. I hadn't trusted him. I hadn't trusted anything to actually take care of me. And so I, with tears streaming down my cheeks, I pledged to the Lord that the tithe would be his from then on. And you know, an interesting thing has happened since then. We by no means are wealthy, but God has provided for everything we need. And since that day in 1980 in October, we have tithed every week. And I just got to tell you this a little bit about that story. And God provided in ways we couldn't even have imagined. In June of that year, the plant shut in October, and the, and the benefits that we got, not from the, not, not from working, but from something that Jimmy Carter, of all people, had signed into law, were good for a year if we were going to school, and I was doing that, and looking for work, and I was doing that, and all we had to do was document that. In June of the next year, a church we'd never heard of before, Marietta, Georgia, called us and asked if we would be willing to come in view of a call to be a full-time staff person. In August, we came and they called us. And I just say this to bring glory to God because the last check we got from that benefit that Jimmy Carter initiated came exactly 
one week, the very last check before, one week before we started working at the new job. All I'm saying is that God is faithful, and we need to trust him. And one way that we can learn to trust him more is by our, our commitment and our connection with the Holy Spirit. James 1, 6 and 7 says, But when you ask God, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Now, sometimes I've been guilty of praying for something, and then when my prayer was not answered as quickly as I wanted to, it to be, or in the way I wanted it to be, I began to try and provide whatever I needed in my own strength, in my own plan. And sure enough, my acting ahead of God's direction always resulted in messing things up more rather than supplying my need. This is a prayer that needs to be prayed daily because my old nature will wake up every morning with the tendency to try and order my life using my plan rather than God's. In truth, the one thing I wake up needing more than anything else is to be filled with the Spirit. I've met some people who have misinterpreted these verses and later said to me, it said to ask God for anything there. I sincerely asked him for a million dollars, and I didn't get it, so the Bible must be wrong. But the term asking in his name implies that I'm going to ask in his will. Neither God the Father, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit will ever grant a prayer request that is outside of God's perfect will. And since they're all without sin, it would be impossible for them to be a part of something that was against the will of God. But when we ask God, we must believe that he, through the Holy Spirit, will answer in the way that is not only helpful or good, but he will answer in the most perfect and beneficial way. Even if it appears he's not going to answer or that his answer was not the best, if we trust him completely, we will be blessed to see that he always blesses us with exactly what we need at exactly the right time. Hebrews 11, 6 but without, says, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we not only need to ask, but we need to ask with the heart of love. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Now that love is not some kind of flimsy love. It's not a love that's conditional or situational, but the love he's talking about is the love the Holy Spirit puts in our hearts. It's God's agape love, the perfect love that comes with the Spirit with no condition. There have been times when I've tried to bargain with God. If you do this, I'll do that. The love that asks in the Spirit is the kind of love that just says, if this is your will. That kind of love keeps on growing, whether or not God answers in the way we want. When I first met Debbie Brink, I found out very soon after I met her that she could sing quite well. I was the minister of music at a church in Michigan, and her family began to attend the church there. And when she came home from college, she came, and I heard her sing, and she joined the choir. And after I heard her sing one time just by chance alone, I said to myself, I need to get her to sing a solo because we sing a lot of solos in that church. And so that was what I thought about her at that point in time. But just a couple of weeks later, our choir went in, to do a concert at my father's church, and after it was over, Debbie and her mom and I went to Wendy's to grab a bite to eat. We weren't dating then or anything like that. I was still, because I still wasn't tithing, I was still very obsessed with money. I never had enough because I didn't trust God with what I was supposed to trust God for. And Debbie made a statement. I actually made some comments about money and how hard it was to get and how much we always needed money. And she made a comment to me. She said, money is not the most important thing. Well, that got my attention too, because instead of just thinking, hey, she can sing pretty well, I said to myself, I need to learn more about this lady. I need to, I need to get to know her better. And so as, as I found out about her, she is the most honest person I've ever known. And as such, she doesn't always answer me in the way I want her to, because she thinks things through, and often she sees a pitfall in my plan. Now, I know you find this hard to believe, but sometimes my plan is flawed. But she loves me with this kind of unconditional love because she has the Holy Spirit living inside her. God, through his Spirit, wants us to love him and to love others in the same way he loves us. And because the Holy Spirit lives inside us, I have the power to love not like Roger loves, 
but like Jesus loves. So if we, if we ask and believe and love God, we will obey. The second half of that verse there says, you will obey my commandments. Obey is a strong word. It's not just an if come thing. It means to keep, to cherish, to guard, to protect the commandments of God faithfully. I've had people ask me the question, what about being free from the old law? I thought we weren't under that anymore. Folks, we don't obey to get saved. We obey because we're saved and we love Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, The love of Christ compels me. The love of Christ is only as operative in our lives as the times that we allow him to speak to our hearts and respond to him in complete obedience, knowing that his message comes from his unconditional, all-knowing, always perfect love. For the husbands watching the service today, what would happen if you said to your wife, I love you, and I've set aside 15 minutes to be with you every Monday at 10 a.m.? I think you know that statement would not be conducive to having a fun-filled day or even a fun-filled life. Yet if some Christians added up the minutes they spend each week with the Lord in his word and in prayer, they might get a picture of why they don't seem to experience more of the power and love of God in their lives. Jesus never said, as long as you can believe, you can do what you want. 1 John 5, 3 says, the proof that we love God comes when we keep his commandments, and they are not at all troublesome. So why is our obedience a litmus test of our love for the Lord? Because when you truly love someone, you'll want to please them, not ignore or treat them badly. The best way we can show our love to the Lord is not verbal only, but with a life that is actively passionate about serving him and obeying his word. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 says, And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. What a powerful statement. How can I be sure I know the Lord if I'm passionate about obeying what he said to do? It go, the verse goes on and says something pretty harsh. If someone claims I know God but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. This verse takes it to another level stating that if we truly know the Lord, we will obey him. The opposite side of the coin says that if I'm not obeying him, I really don't know him and have a relationship with him as my Savior and Lord. Now, why would these verses say that? Because when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit immediately takes up residence in your heart and gives you a passion to love and serve the Lord. Does that mean that you or I will never mess up? Absolutely not. But a person who embraces only the things this world has to offer and demonstrates no or very little desire to be committed to God is proof that the Holy Spirit is probably not living inside that individual. The issue for a true believer is not do I love him, but how can I grow to love him more? And Jesus answered that question in John chapter 15, verses 1 and 4. He says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. Remain in me. And I will remain in you, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. So as they say, it's not rocket science. The more time we spend with God through prayer and in his word, the more we get to know him, and the more we become more like him, and the more we love him, and then the more we love the people in our lives. Now, I'm not saying you got to quit your job and just read the Bible and pray all day long. It doesn't have to be hours and hours each day. Just consistent and real. But it does mean that every waking moment I seek to be aware of his presence in my life and to be obedient to his calling on my life. And if all this takes place, the ask, the believe, the love, and obey, the blessing is given, vibrant and strong and active and powerful that's a blessing not only to us but to every person around us verse 16 says i will ask the father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you the keys to having the holy spirit active and vibrant then in your life and mine to experiencing the blessing of his presence or ask believe love and obey but the master key is love so today as we bow before the lord and consider his claims in our life. If you know the Lord today, and you know that you've asked the Lord to be your Savior, you've asked Jesus to be your Savior, the question is, for you and I, how active is the Holy Spirit in your life? 
Is he someone that you call upon when you think you need something? Is he someone when you realize after several days of not reading the Bible or praying on your own that maybe it would be a good idea to do that? So is he a casual friend? Is he a casual acquaintance? Or is he the most vibrant, most intimate person in your life? Is he the person that you turn to for every need and that you desire to have fellowship with? Because I believe that for a Christian, that's the way it's supposed to be. And I believe that we are harming ourselves if that's not the kind of relationship we have with the Holy Spirit. If it's occasional or, 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 or just superficial. But the people that get blessed the most are the ones who allow Him to be all that He can be to us. And then today, if you happen to be watching this video, I would like to, uh, to ask you another question. Have you ever come to a place in your heart and life where you've asked the Lord Jesus to forgive your sins and be your Savior? You know, God loved us so much that he didn't want to make it where you had to pass some, some gigantic test of Scripture or some other hard thing in order to know him. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not one person that can stand before God when they die and be accepted in heaven based on their own behavior and their own merits. The Romans 6, 23 tells us that the wages of sin is eternal death, but the gift of God who loved us so much is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. John 3, 16 tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him and trusts him would not die in their sins, but would be saved and have everlasting life. And then John 1, 12 says, for all who received him, to them, he gave the right, the privilege to become the children of God. So today, as you're bowing before the Lord, the question that I have for you, first of all, is if you know the Lord, what is your relationship with him like? You know, it doesn't matter how strong it is, we always have room for improvement. So right now, in this time, when you take the time to get with God, just ask Him to give the desire to become even more obedient, even more active in your relationship with Him, even more aware of His presence, even more ready to do whatever He asks you to do. And if you know for sure in your heart today that you've never, never entered into a relationship with Jesus as your Savior, would you take the next few moments as we have some, some time of quietness just to say, God, I know I'm a sinner, and I, I want your forgiveness. I believe Jesus died for, to pay for my sins and rose again to give me eternal life, and I'm asking you to come into my heart and my life right now. Will you do that? The Bible says as many as received him, as many as self called on him, the many, the, as many as prayed that prayer, he gave the right to become children of God. Would you go to the Lord right now as we pause in these moments of silence? God, today we love you. We praise you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Father, I know that if we know you as our Savior, one day we're going to see you, and we're going to be astonished how incredibly amazing you are and how wonderful you are. But Father, we can get a picture and experience in a relationship of that here on earth. The more that we commit ourselves to you, the more that we spend time with you, the more that we yield ourselves to do what you call us to do, we can experience that. So I pray in my own heart and life today, that, Father, that you would have me and, and, and just work in my heart and my spirit to help me crave knowing you more. Help me crave eating your word. Help me crave spending time with your spirit. Help us, Father, as believers to want to have in this life everything we could possibly have through you knowing that you'll handle everything else. And help us to not be afraid to give everything to you, even what we consider 
mundane and trivial. Now, Father, I pray for the ones who may not know you today. I pray this is the day that your Holy Spirit would so powerfully impress upon their hearts that they would make that decision to come to know you. So, Father, once again, we come to the end of this time together. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. We look forward to all the amazing things that you're going to do in our lives and the ministry here at Crossview. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for all of it. In Jesus' blessed name, amen.